let's spend a little time talking about the passive treasures in the upcoming Tombs of Terror. Hey, buddy, watch this. That's right. As is the case with most of these dungeon run style adventures in Hearthstone, there are going to be some treasures offered to you along your journey. And those will come in two forms, passive style effects and cards that you can add into your deck and then play. In this video, I'm going to be talking specifically about the passive style cards and ranking those from basically the weakest to the strongest as far as how positively I think they're going to impact your run on average. That said, let's go ahead and start with some of the weaker passive treasures in Tombs of Terror. These are ones that are certainly still great cards. They have positively minded effects. They're not going to make your deck worse. They're just comparatively not as strong as some of the other options. Ever-changing Elixir here is essentially a random evolve style effect. The problem there is there's often a lot of buffs and really specific cards and cool treasure minions that you're running in your deck. So sometimes it's actually bad to randomly evolve things. You can't control it. You might make it worse. And it just doesn't support really building a deck. This is one that could actually make your deck a little bit weaker. The Discs of Swiftness make your opponent pass their first two turns which most of the time aren't really the strongest turns anyway for most uh, dungeon run style bosses. They're not doing their crazy big stuff in the first couple turns, and they still gain their mana, so they're going to be able to do that big stuff when they get there later. Now, notably, there are occasionally a couple bosses who have like crazy uh, mana jumps. They have like three or four mana at the beginning. This could be a little bit better in those cases, but still, I think weaker overall than, uh, than most other treasures. We have the Band of Bees, which uh, gives minions poisonous if they have two or less mana, which is pretty cool as far as like trading up is concerned. The problem is you don't want your deck to be built around really low cost minions. You want minions that are doing bigger and cooler things, and you don't always want to trade either in uh, dungeon runs. Sometimes just going face puts a lot more pressure on the enemy AI for them to make mistakes. They don't even realize they're dying half the time. So this one falls a little flat. And then finally, unlocked potential. This is uh, basically a lady in white style effect that is buffing your minions theoretically, but it's really restrictive from a drafting standpoint. It often isn't going to do anything, and there are even some downsides as well because you can't really control what minions are offered in given buckets. They may not all line up within a bucket, which means your unlock potential isn't really going to unlock anything at all. So now let's move on to some situational treasures. These are ones that uh, on average may not have like as much raw strength. They're not always going to do something, but in certain wings or uh, with certain deck styles, these could go absolutely crazy. So Band of Scarabs up first gives enemy minions negative one attack. Most of the time, that's not going to be that amazing. Like one attack difference isn't going to open up that many more value trades or completely change how a game uh, is shaped, except in the case perhaps for the first wing of the Tombs of Terror, which is ev evidently going to have tons of murlocs everywhere, and given how many murlocs have one attack, this could just completely lock down the opposing boss's boards, which means, like, for instance, situationally on wing one, Band of Scarabs might be amazing, in other wings it might be far weaker. VIP membership upgrades taverns you're going to visit which essentially means you're going to get extra gold and extra choices when you go to visit uh, uh, Bazaar Bob in this case instead of Bartender Bob. And that could be really cool if you get this early in a run, right? If you get it pre-tavern uh, visits. If you get this late in a run, though, it's probably not going to do much. So you don't want to get your VIP membership halfway or later. If you get it on your first treasure offer, you're good to go. That could be really strong. The Discs of Legend read, after you play a Legendary Minion, summon a copy of it. Well, of course, in this case, that could be great if you have a lot of Legendary Minions. If you don't, if your deck is built around spells or uh, just regular Minions, Discs of Legend isn't going to do much, so there's no reason to run it. And then finally, the Primordial Bulwark is a kind of ice block style effect that's going to block lethal damage and deal 20 damage to the enemy hero to the opposing boss and it happens once per game so uh this one is like not going to help you unless you lose which isn't a great thing but if you have this deck that can play really late or play from behind or has a lot of healing or maybe has a ton of burst damage and that 20 damage matters then sure a card like that could do something so now let's move on to the generally strong passive treasures I've identified here. The Lucky Spade reads, after you discover a card, add two copies of it to your hand. They all cost two less. 
which is amazing. And this might seem situational because you might say, oh, well, you know, um, you got to have discover cards in your deck to make something like this relevant. But there are some hero powers that are going to support this really nicely just by default. Beyond that, discover cards are kind of just everywhere. You can get a handful of those and it doesn't take many to make this amazing because the cost discounts are really going to start to stack up. It's a ton of extra resource generation. So this one will go very, very far. Moving on to the robes of diminishing. It reads after you draw a spell, reduce its cost to zero this turn. That can be pretty fantastic if you have any card draw on your deck or just sometimes generally top decking a spell and having a really powerful tempo play off of it can be great. And if you can run really big spells in your deck, that's gonna go far. The only reason this isn't in my top five cards which we're gonna get to shortly uh, is the fact that sometimes you top deck a spell and you just don't need to play it. Like you don't need a flame strike right now because your opponent doesn't have any stuff. So sometimes this discount can whiff, but other times it's gonna offer a lot of opportunity. And then finally the mummy magic, much like our lucky spade, it sounds situational in a way because it's about death rattle minions. But again, death rattle minions are so common, so easy to grab. And there are other ways to support this too through like signature treasures, other treasures, uh, clearly a lot of buckets and classes out there better support this than others, but there are still plenty. And giving a Death Rattle Minion Reborn is fantastic because Death Rattles start going off twice instead of once. And it's also just really sticky board states. One Sylvanas might make this worth it in your deck too. So Mummy Magic uh, has a lot of potential upside. That's why I think it deserves a spot here in the strong cards. So that said, let's move into our top five passive treasure, starting off with Titanic Ring. This one gives your minions plus one health and taunt. And I like this one so much just because it's like ever present and universally impactful. A lot of other treasures, certain things have to happen. You got to play certain kinds of things. You got to draw certain kinds of things. This one, as long as you have minions, this is going to be amazing. And particularly with the first wing with summoning lots of random murlocs, you're guaranteed to have lots of minions in play. So Titanic Ring goes really far. And that's great. Now, plus one health isn't like a huge difference. Like I talked about with the negative one attack, like I don't know how often that's going to deny trades or occasionally that one health will matter. But over the course of a game, it's really going to start to add up, right? It's like five, six, seven trades, surviving against removal, surviving against uh, damage spells, all these kinds of things. It's going to add up to a lot of extra chip damage, a lot of extra onboard value. So uh, the taunt aspect can be a little bit of a downside in some ways if you want to protect things. Like, you know, if you have an Archmage Antonidas, you want to hide behind a taunt. You can't because he's going to come down with taunt. So you have to be a little bit mindful about how you build your deck. That's why this one's not higher on the list. There are still some challenges. But I think it's just so universal that it's going to work out very, very well most of the time. Moving on to the number four spot here is Scroll of Nonsense, a card that gives you spell damage plus 10 at the start of the game by default, passively. And at the end of your turn, that is reduced by one. So like um, on turn two, you have nine spell damage. On turn three, you have eight, right? And it starts going down and down. But here's the deal, right? Even when this gets down to like a plus three passive spell damage, that's still amazing. And that's pretty far into the game where you can really start to utilize this. Now, it does go away post turn 10, which is unfortunate because sometimes you will need to go post turn 10 against like Plague Lords in particular. So it has pretty clear diminishing returns, very obvious ones. But nonetheless, I think the impacts will be so big along the way that it'll be worth it. I mean, just think about cards like Arcane Missiles on turn one suddenly, right? It's like 13 damage instead of three. We'll clear anything. We'll do tons of face damage. Could one shot some bosses early in the run, perhaps. Uh, so there are some pretty crazy ways to utilize this. If you build a deck at all to support it, even if you don't, like just three or four spells might be enough to make this worth it. So in some ways, hyper situational, I guess, but I think the upside is so obvious here and so big that it still deserves this spot. Moving on to the Dark Light Torch. This one reads, after you play an even cost card, which by the way, I think it's awesome to see even an odd style effects uh, implemented here. It will refresh your hero power and that hero power will cost zero this turn. So uh, clearly there's some really powerful hero powers offered to the heroes here, the League of Explorers in Tombs of Terror, and this enables you to play them multiple times in a turn, which is pretty nuts. And think about it too, like zero cost cards are even cost cards. So you can actually like do some crazy stuff with zero mana stuff, 
if you can like cycle lots of infinite hero powers and lots of zero mana spells. I don't know. Shenanigans are possible. Shenanigans are certainly afoot. And even if you don't just you know, play one or two even cost cards in a turn, just getting a couple free hero powers goes a really, really long way. And I don't even think you really have to build your deck around even cost cards. Roughly half your cards are going to be even most of the time anyway. So there's plenty of options and you can kind of keep an eye on it as you assemble a deck too to help support this better. But if you have any kind of good hero power, Dark Light Torch seems like it's going to scale to an absurd level offering as much power as pretty much anything in the game. So moving on to my number two spot, it's the Crook and Flail. This one is a passive that summons a minion from your deck anytime you cast a spell. And uh, that means every spell cast has tons of value packed into it. Not only do you have a strong spell you're playing, but you're also getting some giant minion, presumably, from your deck. Now, occasionally you'll get some small minions too, but hey, it's totally free. And often, with these dungeon runs, you can pick big stuff to support a treasure like this. Start adding some big minions to your deck. And generally you kind of want those anyway. You often picking, you often end up picking a lot of just big value minions throughout the course of the game. And Crook and Flail is going to make those amazing. So, you know, play a couple early spells, get a couple Lich Kings on board, boom, boom, the game is over, job done. Even if it doesn't high roll that far, just a lot of consistency on board goes a long way. The risk here, I guess, is that you can fatigue yourself out a little bit faster if you're not careful because you're pulling cards out of your deck these aren't copies they are minions so against like a plague lord you may be a little risky if you go into fatigue so finding some way to perhaps avoid that problem getting some additional resources some shuffle cards whatever it might be could really help ease any pressures this cards create but i think there's so much tempo on this one regardless you'll end in, end up winning the games way sooner than that ever becomes a problem anyway so crook and flail pretty crazy card and then finally here at my top spot we have the alchemist stone and the reason this card's the top spot is because we've seen time and time again in any dungeon run style mode, significant mana discounting is very impactful and it's often the best thing you can do. Robes of gaudiness, etc. And with Alchemist Stone, you can create some really cool chaining discounts because after you play an odd cost card with this one, it will reduce the cost of all cards in your hand by one mana. So what that means is, right, you start a turn with... Um, a three mana card and a two mana card in hand, right? You play the three mana card, the two mana card gets reduced to one. You play the one mana card that is now reduced to one and now odd cost, and it will further reduce uh, the cost of any additional cards in your hand. So you can start chaining cards really nicely. So technically even cards that start out as even cost cards can still help you facilitate that chain. And you might be saying, well, Regis, are you sure it works that way? Just trust me, I'm sure. <laughs> Just Believe me on this one, I can promise you it works that way, which means you can kind of cascade this discount down your hand and like everything is super cheap within a couple turns, maybe your entire hand is like zero mana, which clearly allows you to make enormous tempo impacts onto the board, clear stuff for free, whatever you want to do, Alchemist Stone helps set that up. So this can single-handedly just win you games in a turn or two with ginormous discounts and because of that, I think it's pretty obviously to me the strongest option. Like, I don't think you'll ever want to pass this one up. It just works way too well. And there you go. Those are the passive treasures for the Tombs of Terror. So, uh, I mean, frankly, you can't go wrong with any of these. Whatever one looks the most fun to you, you're probably going to be able to succeed to some extent. But certainly, some of those near the top, I'm confident, will be stronger than others. That said, uh, if you disagree for some reason, if you think I'm crazy and there are better options or something I overlooked, some cool combo, some reason I didn't quite see the value in one of these cards, share those thoughts in the comments below. Of course, this is all uh, conjecture, speculation. We don't really know exactly how things are going to unfold because we haven't fought the bosses. We haven't seen the effects. One of these could be amazing for some secret reason. I want to hear your thoughts. Tell me why you like the cards you like. And uh, until then, thank you so very much for watching. And until next time, game on.